presenter is Mike Stollard who is now y'all got a new name I can't remember the name of your school well, it used to be Baptist Bible Seminary well the, the seminary still has its name Baptist Bible Seminary okay but the university the Summit University now Summit is, University in Clark, of Baptist Bible College okay in Clark Summit Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania that's by Scranton where Joe Biden is from right that's correct Uncle Joe. And, and Hillary has some relatives in the Methodist Church there. So. Okay. <laughs> and Wonderful place to live. Yeah. Mike has done a lot of presentations over the years here, and uh, he is writing a commentary on Revelation, aren't you? I'm trying to. For your entire life, almost. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to him talk about uh, amillennialism. Well, I don't know if we're looking forward about that, but he's going to give a critical uh, review of a guy named Sam Storms, who I went to seminary with and uh, lives in Oklahoma. So we saw the good guy from Oklahoma, Mark, just now. And, uh, but Sam's a good guy. He just uh, went astray in these areas, you know. And he wrote a book defending amillennialism, and Mike's going to... Um, critique it. So, go ahead. Okay. Thanks for the privilege of uh, being here to speak to everyone and, and deliver this paper. I do want to give a commercial for my school. Um, Summit University is the university, Baptist Bible Seminary, our seminary. Uh, we have 90 doctoral students at our seminary. We have 39 PhD students, 51 doctoral ministry students. And, and I said yesterday I'm prowling for students, so if anybody would like to talk to me, I have some literature out on the table. I'd love to talk to you about uh, an opportunity for education, if that's what the Lord wants in your life. We do have uh, some Russian students from Siberia, and uh, we've been approached officially uh, to come over there and do an extension site, and they say they have 50 PhD students for us. So we're praying through that option, and we're kind of excited about that uh, possibility, although as a Alabama boy who spent 13 years in Texas. I don't relish going to Siberia to teach modules. <laughs> but uh, we'll see what the Lord has for us. Well, let's get to it. Uh, Sam Storm's 2013 work, Kingdom Come, presents one of the latest detailed presentations defending amillennialism over against premillennialism. Storms, lead pastor of Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City, usually writes in an ironic tone which allows the reader who disagrees to engage the book without being emotionally directed. The book deals with many passages in an attempt to ground the amillennial position in biblical teaching. Unlike Sproul's work, The Last Days According to Jesus, Storms refers to many Old Testament passages, something that most dispensationalists immediately look for in conversation with those coming from a New Testament priority position. Storms' attention to prophetic passages that also attract premillennialists assures that his book is an important contemporary work in the dialogue between amillennialists and premillennialists. Overview of the book. A book-length review would be needed to analyze every chapter in the book. However, an overview of the book is important before a critique of a few key points is given. Kingdom Come begins appropriately with a chapter on hermeneutics. Here, Storm surveys five key foundational principles for interpreting prophecy, none of which are new in the debate between premillennialism and amillennialism. A second chapter attempts to define dispensationalism. While doing so, Storms presents doctrinal conclusions without paying a lot of attention to the hermeneutical underpinnings of those conclusions. In this way, his first two chapters seem to be unduly separated. Chapters 3 and 4 deal with eschatological texts in the book of Daniel, one chapter on Daniel 9 and the 70 weeks, and the other chapter on Daniel chapters 2 and 7 to 12. 
It is important for dispensationalists to see in these chapters how one amillennial approach differs and argues in some crucial passages. Chapter 5 surveys problems with premillennialism according to Storm's assessment. Again, nothing new in argumentation appears. Premillennialists have been used to hearing amillennial arguments from such passages as Romans 8, 18 to 23, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 28, and 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 57. The following chapter 6 examines the theological concept of the people of God. Israel, the church, and replacement theology are discussed. Traditional passages from the amillennial arsenal are marshaled, such as Romans 9, 6 to 7, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, Galatians 3, Galatians 6, 16, and others in support of amillennial conclusions. Chapter 7 and 8 give an exposition of Matthew 24 and the Olivet Discourse. One specific issue in chapter 8 is Storm's insistence that the fig tree is not Israel. He certainly should respond to that view, which is held by some dispensationalists. However, it may be that the majority of dispensational premillennialists hold that the fig tree in Matthew 24:32 is a natural figure and not a symbolic one. Storms does not acknowledge this fact in his overview. Chapter 9 of Kingdom Come gives a review of the book of Acts on the debate. In particular, Storms covers Acts 1, 6 to 8, and Acts 15. Unfortunately, Acts 3, 19 to 21, a crucial passage in the eyes of many dispensationalists, is left unexplored. Chapter 10 analyzes the extremely significant passage of Romans 11 and this discussion of the future of Israel. Chapter 11 in his book presents Storm's understanding of an already not yet view of the kingdom of God that is in keeping with conventional wisdom within evangelicalism. In doing this, he explicitly states indebtedness to George Ladd. On the other side, dispensational premillennialists dispute the conventional wisdom of the evangelical herd. Chapter 12 gives an ironic analysis of postmillennialism while showing the differences with amillennialism. Suitably, four entire chapters, 13 through 16, are given over to analysis of the book of Revelation. Chapter 13 traces the seal, trumpet, and bold judgments, following closely the work of Beale. Chapter 14, perhaps the most noteworthy part of the discussion of Revelation, outlines the debate in Revelation 20 and the binding of Satan, the Achilles heel of amillennialism according to premillennialists. Chapter 15 continues the discussion of Revelation 20 by examining the reference to the first resurrection. Chapter 16 studies the personage of the Antichrist by reviewing Revelation chapters 13 and 17. A continuing study of the Antichrist is given in chapter 17 of the book as it addresses 2 Thess Thessalonians 2. A concluding chapter summarizes a cumulative case made for amillennialism. Dispensationalists can appreciate the length of the book and the details provided by storms. Hopefully, full book length reviews can be provided by the premillennial side. What follows begins the process. Case studies in four key passages. Elements from four biblical passages, two from Paul, Daniel 9, and Revelation 20, will be analyzed below, giving examples of how Storms presents his omillennial case and how the premillennialist should respond. This is only a small portion of the passages which Storms discusses. Generalizations from these four case studies should only be made cautiously. Each passage and its use should be studied on its own. However, once all the information is absorbed, the student will find that Storms defends a classical understanding of amillennialism. There is little that is new. The positive contribution of Storms is to collect the large amount of argumentation in one place. In this, he has done a great service for the evangelical community. I'm trying to be nice. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, 26, and 50 to 58. Storm summarizes the amillennial argument based upon 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 22, 26, and 50 to 57 with the statement that if you are a premillennialist, you must necessarily believe that physical death will continue to exist beyond the time of Christ's second coming. He goes on to couple that statement with the words, death is defeated and swallowed up in victory at the parousia. The basic idea is that premillennialism cannot be right since it teaches that death continues after the second coming. How is this known? The New Testament explicitly teaches, according to Storms, that the second coming of Christ is the end of death. A biblical chapter of specific interest in this regard is 1 Corinthians 15, where some verses are taken by Storms to prove that premillennialists are wrong. Starting with 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 26. Uh, this particular passage frequently comes up in dialogue involving all millennialists and premillennialists. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming, 
Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. This is certainly a beautiful passage that highlights the greatness of Christ's work on our behalf. In verses 23 to 24, there are three things listed in succession. Christ the first fruits, those who are Christ at his coming, at the end where death appears to be abolished according to verse 26. Storms does a good job of outlining the two views. He argues from the amillennial perspective that the text leads assuredly to the conclusion that there is no gap between number two and number three. These two events are linked so that the parousia, verse 23, ushers in the end, verse 24, when death is abolished, verse 26. Premillilists see a gap of 1,000 years between the parousia, number two, and the end, number three. This is justified partly by the obvious fact that there is a gap of nearly two millennia between number one and number two in the list if Jesus were to rapture the church today. So the idea of an interval between the second and third things in the list is not far-fetched. As Lowry notes, if about 2,000 years can elapse between the first and second phases in this selected presentation of events, a lapse of half that time, that is a millennium, between the second and third phases should cause no consternation. Premillennialism requires an interval. The wording of the passage allows for that and even encourages such an understanding. Thus, these verses are not a clear argument in favor of the idea that the second coming brings the end of death immediately. The amillennial argument of storms acknowledges the gap between the first two items in the list and the use of this fact by premillennial interpreters. He further acknowledges what some amillennial interpreters do not, that the word then, Ada, in verse 24, does not by itself suggest that the parousia and the time of the consummation are chronologically coinciding. Quote, before proceeding, note well that the matter under dispute is not whether the terms Paul used, epida and eta, both of which are translated then by the ESV, will admit of a time gap. Obviously, they may. The question is whether or not in this context they do. I will argue below, below that other factors in the text prohibit our interpreting Paul as saying that there is a gap of a thousand years, the millennium, between the resurrection of Christ's people at his second coming and the end. This is not to deny the obvious gap between the resurrection of Christ and that of Christians, but no such gap, I will argue, is possible in the case of our resurrection and the end. Storms correctly avoid saying too much about Ada. The historic premillennialist Grudem notes the two words translated then in this passage both take the sense after that, not the sense at that same time. Therefore, the passage gives some support to the idea that just as there is an interval of time between Christ's resurrection and his second coming when we receive a resurrection body, so there is an interval of time between Christ's second coming and the end. Grudem goes on to cite examples. The Greek word eta does mean after that. It does not always indicate temporal sequence because it can also introduce the next item or argument in a logical progression but in narrating historical occurrences, it indicates something that happens after something else. The Pauline examples are instructive. Even earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, verses five and seven, the words Ada and Epida are used to introduce elements in a list when there are definitely time intervals between the items. Rather than rely upon a conclusion based upon the adverbs in the verses, Storms appeals to a larger context question. Quote, in summary, the end, Tatelos marks the close of Christ's reign, or at least that phase of it with which Paul is concerned. It is brought to its climax by the complete and final overthrow of death. The point of dispute is the time of the end. The premillennialist argues that the end is the end or close of the millennial age, a thousand years after Christ has returned to earth. The amillennialist argues that the end is the end or close of the present church age, signaled and brought to fruition by Christ's second coming. It seems clear that all one need to do is demonstrate which of these two options is correct and the millennial debate would come to a close. This isn't as difficult as one might think since both eschatological schools agree that Christ's reign consummates with the destruction of death and since the destruction of death signals the end, we need only ascertain the time of death's death. To answer this question and determine the correct interpretation, Storms now moves to the later context of 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. These verses speak of the elimination of the power of death over believers. Death is swallowed up in victory, verse 54, and the sting of death is removed, verses 55 to 57. Before that, Paul states that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, verse 50. 
Storms is correct in noting that there is a focus here on glorified believers entering into God's kingdom. However, Storms draws some unwarranted implications from that fact, which premillennialists, especially dispensationalists, will dispute. He comments that only those who have been constantly transformed in body and spirit by that resurrection, glorification, brought to pass at the return of Christ, shall inherit the kingdom of God. He goes on to say, the kingdom in view, according to the premillennialist, is the millennial kingdom, that very reign of Christ we noted above in 1 Corinthians 15, 24. But how can that be? The premillennialist argues that many believers will enter and inherit and enjoy the blessings of the millennial kingdom in their natural, unglorified, untransformed flesh and blood bodies. But that is precisely what Paul denies could ever happen. Consequently, Storms can end his logic by saying, I'm compelled to conclude that Paul's declaration that unglorified flesh and blood bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God precludes a millennium following the second coming of Christ. What is the premillennialist to say to such argumentation? Is Storms' approach the only plausible way to understand the text? The dispensational premillennialist begins his answer by relating this passage to the time of the pre-trib rapture. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Verses 51 and 52, the passage speaks of this event as putting on immortality and the removal of death. The sting of death is removed, death is swallowed up in victory. From a dispensational understanding, the Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the glorification of church saints at the pre-trib rapture of the church. We shall all be changed. The amillennialists cannot assume that the word we refers to all saints of all times in history. One cannot assume a definition of church as the collection of all the saved of all ages or since Adam or Abraham. This is a doctrinal or theological assumption which will be challenged by dispensationalists. If that assumption is read into the text, then the amillennial position may have some ground to stand on. If not, then the passage does not automatically say that the second coming ends death for the entire universe. Instead, it is saying that the end of death for church saints happens at the rapture when there is a resurrection and glorification that takes place for that particular group of people. Death is certainly swallowed up forever and in victory for the church at that time. The church saints will never again have to face death for themselves. Thus, on this point, dispensational premillennialism is a position that can be harmonized quite easily with this passage. The premillennialist might say to the amillennialist that he makes the passage say too much and that a forced theological unity has been brought to the passage. Elsewhere on the timeline of God's end time plan, the Lord will deal with other peoples according to his will, such as the resurrection of Old Testament saints, along with tribulation saints who have died at the end of the tribulation period, see Daniel 12.2. This way of rebuttal still leaves the question raised by storms and other amillennialists of the ontological impossibility of a millennial kingdom with unglorified people tribulation saints who survive and enter the millennium based upon 1 Corinthians 15, 50. But is ontology the real question? Is there something about human beings generally and inherently that must be changed in order for them to be part of the coming millennial kingdom? Or is 1550 a statement of God's design for church saints? In other words, is there an ontological necessity or is it simply something that God has decided to do for church saints? Could it be that this is another case of the bent of amillennialists toward unity versus the dispensational bent toward diversity? Amillennialists here appear to collapse the plan of God down into a single event. Dispensational premillennialists respond that such a forced unity does not do justice to the details of the various texts and the timeline of those texts. Neither is the conclusion compelled by the context. Dispensationalists believe that the entire sequence of the end times from rapture to the new earth leads to the end of death in a universal sense, but that the church saints begin to experience this victory at the start of the sequence. However, the full blessings of the life to come, to borrow a phrase from Hokema, will only be available in the eternal state. At least two corollary issues need to be considered. It is quite possible that the concept of inheriting the kingdom, a future prospect, often overlooked in the emphasis of amillennialist on the present aspect of kingdom during the church age, refers to something other than an ontological necessity. Peter suggests that the idea of inheritance is the function of ruling which believers undertake. From this vantage point, it may be that those who enter the millennium unglorified, trib saints who survive, will not rule over glorified saints. A second corollary of this debate would be the lack of Old Testament perspective for the amillennialist. Walver describes the problem this way. A common assumption of amillennialism is that living saints will be translated at the time of the second advent. There is seldom any facing of the significant fact that none of the Old Testament passages dealing with the second advent teach anything on the subject of the translation of the saints. 
In fact, the idea of a general translation is foreign to the Old Testament. The viewpoint of Old Testament prophecies is that saints on earth at the time of the second advent will enter the millennial kingdom in the flesh, an obvious contradiction of the idea of translation. This is clearly taught by the fact that saints will till the ground, raise crops, and have children born to them, all of which would be quite incredible for translated saints. It is safe to say that no passage in the Old and New Testament, which is accepted by all parties as relating to the second advent of Christ at the end of the tribulation, ever speaks of translation of the saints. All passages dealing with translation concerning the coming of Christ for His church, which is distinguished from the second coming proper. This is not to say that Storms ignores the Old Testament. His desire to treat it in many of its details is praiseworthy as mentioned earlier. However, the conclusions he draws do not account fully for the explanation of all the details. The judgment is that his approach is not comprehensive enough, a problem that all interpreters must face. At any rate, it's clear that 1 Corinthians 15 does not automatically eliminate the premillennial position as Storms asserts. Romans 8, 18 to 23. Another reason that Storms gives to remove the premillennial position from consideration is that if you're a premillennialist, you must necessarily believe that the natural creation will continue beyond the time of Christ's second coming to be subjected to the curse imposed by the fall of man. He goes on to affirm that in conjunction with this idea, the natural creation is set free from its bondage at the parousia. The basic idea is that premillennialism, premillennialism cannot be right since it teaches the, that Christ's second coming does not end the curse on the natural created order. This particular argument is actually a variation or extension of the argument based upon 1 Corinthians 15. In his book, Kingdom Come, Storms gives a decent summary of the premillennial position of some who hold that view. Notwithstanding the presence of Christ himself, as premillennialists argue, the earth will continue to be ravaged by war and sin and death, even if only at the millennium's end. Revelation 27 to 10. As a premillennialist, you must necessarily believe that the redemption of the natural creation and its being set free from bondage to corruption does not occur, at least in its consummate expression, until 1,000 years subsequent to Christ's return. So the question becomes, are there clear passages that teach that Christ's second coming will remove the curse on nature? Storms think so. The main passage in this regard is Romans 8, 18 to 23. He takes the passage to teach that the created order will be set free from bondage, verse 21, at the exact time when Christ returns, from a premillennial point of view at the end of the tribulation, to manifest or make known the sons of God in resurrection, verses 19 and 23. In light of the continuing curse in the millennium for premillennialists and the removal of the curse after the millennium, Storm believes that this is an insurmountable problem for premillennialists. Hendrickson concurs. Verses 19 to 23 make very clear that he is referring to what will transpire at the time of revelation of the sons of God and of the redemption, glorious resurrection of our bodies. In other words, at the time of Christ's return. Strumple joins in making the same interpretive deduction. The Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, teaches us that the resurrection glory of the children of God will mark the resurrection glory of creation as well. This is at Christ's coming, not a millennium later. Now there's some good things Storms has said here. In fact, it can be conceded that his approach to this text is a possible and reasonable interpretation. Premillennialists can understand where he's coming from. However, Storms' interpretation is not the only reasonable way to take the text. The text does not clearly give the timing of the removal of the curse on creation. It only says that the creation looks for the revealing of the sons of God and that creation will one day be delivered from bondage. To assume that these two things match chronologically is a reasonable deduction from the text, but not a necessary deduction from the text. Premillennialists have responded in a couple of ways. There are some premillennial interpreters who are willing to assert in agreement with Storms that the second coming is when the creation is set free from bondage. For example, Ironside notes that in the present age, creation does not share in the liberty of grace. It shall have its part in the liberty of glory, the kingdom age of millennial blessing. The changes to nature at the beginning of the millennium perhaps justify this conclusion, Zechariah 14 and Isaiah 11 as two examples. Such interpreters would probably acknowledge if asked that the release from bondage is a beginning and not a consummation. However, Ironside's wording does not take this into consideration. Another premillennial way of viewing this passage comes from Crow, who probably represents the common way that dispensational premillennialists handle the text. But just as humans are linked with the pain of the curse on the earth, so humans are linked with lifting that curse and its attendant pain. The whole creation is anxiously awaiting the revealing of the sons of God. For it is only when that, the pain, uh, 
uh, only then that the pain that creation endures as a result of God's curse will cease. Today the curse covers the world and brings the groaning of pain even to that which is inanimate. Yet one day God will remove the curse and save the earth from its pain when he establishes his millennial kingdom here on earth. The millennium is when the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the little child will put his hand into the snake's nest and not be hurt. And as glorious as that messianic age will be, it will be only a prelude to eternity when creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. A similar understanding is provided by Whitmer. Similarly, since God's program of salvation for people is one of a new creation, the physical world also will be recreated. This will take place in two stages. First will be the renovation of the present cosmos in conjunction with the return to earth of the Lord Jesus and the establishment of the Messianic kingdom on earth. The second stage will be creation of a new heaven and a new earth. In this premillennial approach, it is possible to see Romans 8, 18 to 23, teaching that the created order longs to see the manifestation of the sons of God, the second coming, because it is a reminder that its redemption is on its way, although at a later time. The sinking of the two chronologically is not necessary. The necessary linkage is the shared hope for redemption. This interpretation is not an unreasonable one unless one assumes an amillennial understanding at the outset. The gap between the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Uh, within this one paper, it's not possible to address all of Storm's comments on the book of Daniel. However, one selected issue will be used to show his faulty interpretation. Significantly, he denies that there's a time gap between the 69th and 70th week, as dispensationalists teach. While Storms addresses several key points within his interpretation of the prophecy, he does not reveal any detailed exegesis of Daniel 9, 24-27 concerning the gap. Instead, he asks questions and makes assertions which accuse dispensationalists of forcing their interpretation on the text a priori. Notice his comment. I am convinced that the theory of a gap is motivated as much by antecedent determination to find additional justification for distinguishing between Israel and the church as it is by any factors actually present in the text itself. In other words, if one has not already decided in favor of two distinct peoples of God with distinct dispensations in which God deals with each, would Daniel 9 ever have been interpreted in such a way as to yield the concept of a gap between the 69th and 70th weeks? Or again, to put it even more bluntly, dispensationalists find a gap in Daniel 9 because they are predisposed to find one in order to justify an already existent theological construct. So he accuses us of reading our theology into the Bible. In summary, uh, that's what he says, my sentence says, we read that rather than doing proper exegesis. While appreciating Storm's honest presentation, I think he really believes that. It is disappointing that there is no exegetical response concerning the gap. Only a cursory examination of the actual text of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 shows that there is enough exegetical evidence to suggest a gap. Miller's exposition notes the following. The text also indicates that the 70th seven would not follow the 69th immediately. For, ex for example, Christ's crucifixion and the subsequent destruction of Jerusalem would occur after the 69th week, but not during the 70th week, revealing a gap between these sevens. Harold Horner, in his definitive work on the 70 weeks prophecy, uh, definite work on the 70 weeks prophecy, definitively proves the existence of an exegetical and theological gap by means of seven arguments. Horner uses both exegetical and theological arguments to make his case. In no argument, however, does he assume the distinction between Israel and the church or force such a distinction into the text as Storms posits. The language simply suggests that the death of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem happened after the 69th week and before the 70th week. Even the post-tribulationist Gundry, who we like to criticize, agrees with this conclusion. If the cutting off of the Messiah occurred in the middle of the 70th week, it is very strange that the cutting off is set to be after the 69 weeks, figuring the sum of the 7 and 62 weeks. Much more naturally, the text would have read during or in the midst of the 70th week, as it does in verse 27 concerning the stoppage of the sacrifices. The only adequate explanation for this unusual turn of expression is that the 70th week did not follow on the heels of the 69th, but that an interval separates the two. The crucifixion then comes shortly after the 69th, but not within the 70th because of an intervening gap. The possibility of a gap between the 69th and 70th weeks is established by the well-accepted Old Testament phenomena of prophetic perspective in which gaps such as that between the first and second advents were not perceived. 
Gundry simply asserts that the exegetical results of seeing a gap should not be surprising in light of the existence of gaps elsewhere in the Old Testament. Dispensationalists have explored the exegetical and theological issues of gaps in great detail because the actual text involved lead them in that direction. And I footnote an article, um, Prophetic Postponement by Randall Price that I encourage you to read. Storms interacts with little of the dispensational work along these lines. As a result of the exegetical and theological realities, he has merely dismissed the dispensational view of the gap as a case of theological proof texting. In actuality, he has proving nothing at all. Perhaps in later editions of the book, he can expand this section with proper exposition and less assumptions. The binding of Satan in Revelation 20 and the structure of the book of Revelation. The ongoing problem that Amalinum has with the binding of Satan is dealt with in two chapters in Kingdom Come. Chapter 13 gives Storm's approach to the arrangement of the book of Revelation. The structure helps to set up the context of Revelation chapter 20 within the book. Hence, in the next chapter, 14 of Storm's book, he deals with the binding of Satan, which has become a problem largely because of the structure that has been chosen. A little aside here, I teach my students there's something theologically deep that you need to know. So this is the deepest thing I'll ever say to you in class, to prove premillennialism. And that is that 19 comes before 20. <laughs> Second coming in chapter 19, the millennium in chapter 20. Okay. So the amillennialist has to destroy any chronology between those two chapters. They have to or they die there. See, I could be wrong in that, in that whole book of Revelation. I could be wrong. And it doesn't rule out a coming literal earthly kingdom on the basis of other passages. But if they're wrong there, everything dies for them. So they have to do something about that. So here's, here's what Storms does. The structure of Revelation that Storms defends is what this author sometimes refers to as the amillennial recapitulation view. It's often associated with the name of Augustine. Storms also refers to it as progressive parallelism. This view appears to be the majority view within the amillennial camp. The specific outline divides the chapters of Revelation into seven sections as follows. That doesn't make him a dispensationalist. <laughs> uh, 1 through 3, 4 through 7, 8 through 11, 12 to 14, 15 to 16, 17 to 19, 20 to 22. Notice that 19 and 20 are separated in different sections. See that? Each section recapitulates the time beginning with the first advent. This approach is based largely upon common elements in the seals, trumpets, and bold judgments. The advantage of this structure for amillennialism is that it allows the thousand years of Revelation 20 to be associated with the present age and not a future age. Revelation 20 begins the last recapitulation section of the book. Hence, it is clearly associated with the inter-advent period. In this way, amillennialism affirms the millennium of Revelation 20, usually as an indeterminate period of time that begins with the first coming of Christ. Dispensational premillennialists give several responses to this particular approach to the structure of the book of Revelation. First, the amillennial recapitulation view cannot be harmonized with the outline of the book given by the book itself in 119. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, what will take place later. This outline corresponds roughly to chapter 1, chapters 2 and 3, and chapters 4 to 22. Futuristic implications stem from the dispensational approach. The amillennialist Beale, who holds to a form of the recapitulation view, understands the significance of the debate over 119 and dedicates a whole chapter to its understanding. A second response to the amillennial recapitulation view is the chiameter or chimeter in the book of Revelation. The dispensationalist Heinsohn adroitly notes the following. The predominant term which keeps the book of Revelation constantly moving is the word and, or Greek chi. The term chi used over 1,200 times in the Revelation is generally translated and, although it also appears translated as but, even, both, also, yet, and indeed. The average reader does not realize that nearly every verse of the apocalypse begins with chi. This phenomenon is known as polysyndeton, meaning many ands. These are used to bind together the numeric units of the Revelation in the pattern known as chiameter. Heinzen goes on to add that it is this constant sense of progression that clearly indicates the revelation is moving the reader toward a final climax. This chimeter gives the book of Revelation a Hebraic narrative feel reminding one of the Hebrew wall consecutive. What this observation means for the current discussion is that the historic progression of the text of Revelation cannot be denied in spite of the various interludes along the way. 
the chiometer mitigates against the possibility that there is a restart going back to the first advent beginning in Revelation 20 verse 1. Chapters 19 and 20 cannot be separated in light of the usual narrative progression. Third, the subject matter of chapters 19 and 20 is part of a unity that cannot be divided. In particular, these chapters contain the final unified dealings of Christ with the unholy trinity, Antichrist, false prophet, and Satan. The first two are dealt with in chapter 19, the last one in chapter 20. Thomas goes further in saying that the seventh bowl judgment extends from 1617 to 22.5. He has a large unity there. Such a conclusion can only be reached if there is a unified approach to the final judgments that lead to the coming in of the kingdom. The flow of the chapters easily read as a unified whole rather than a subdivided, recapitulated account. Coupled with the uh, chiometer mentioned above, one is hard pressed to dissolve the unity of chapters 19 and 20. Fourth, the most debated point in the matter continues to be the binding of Satan as given in 22 and 3. If chapter 20 starts again with the present age within a recapitulation scheme, then the obvious conclusion is that Satan is bound today. Premillennialists point out several observations that make it clear that Satan is not bound today. In the letters to the seven churches, one can find three references to Satan's present activity of agitation in the churches. In the book of Acts, there are clear mentions or inferences that Satan is active after the day of Pentecost. The Apostle Paul clearly teaches that the devil still vigorously opposes believers in the present time. The Apostle Peter warns believers that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. All such passages show that Satan is not bound today. In reply, Storms gives a usual amillennial answer by restic restricting the nature of the binding. However, the question must be asked, in regard to what is Satan bound? This is Sam Storms talking. Is the binding of Satan designed to immobilize him from any and all activities? The premillennialists think so. Beasley Murray tells us that Satan's binding entails his inability to harm the race of man. But that is not what John says. The premillennial interp interpretation errs in that it has attempted to universalize what John explicitly restricts. Two statements in Revelation 20 tell us the purpose of Satan's imprisonment. First, in verse 3, John says that Satan was bound so that he should not deceive the nations any longer. In this context, Storms acknowledges the passages cited above by premillennialists, but says that they do not apply to the issue of the binding of Satan to keep him from deceiving the nations. Satan cannot deceive the nations, but he can persecute the church. Storms accuses premillennialists of taking the imagery of the binding too literally when it is binding for a specific purpose. However, the imagery of the binding must be taken seriously. Is the picture of the prevention of Satan's activity among the peoples of the world? In Acts 13.10, Paul confronts a person outside the church who is among the nations. Yet according to the text, Satan has his deceiving way with the pagan that Paul encounters. Is this not an example of Satan actively deceiving people among the nations? Mountain, describing the imagery of Revelation 20, notes the elaborate measures taken to ensure his custody, that Satan's custody, are most easily understood as implying the complete cessation of his influence on earth rather than the curbing of his activities. Walvert asked the pertinent question, if God wanted to show that Satan was totally inactive and out of touch with the world, how could he have rendered it more specifically than he has done in this passage? All that is needed is one counterexample in the Bible to show Satan deceiving an individual within the nations of the world. Acts 13.10 provides such an example, which in the end prevents the amillennialists from asserting that Satan is not deceiving the nations. The case is more problematic for the amillennialists when Pauline teaching on the matter is examined. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 states the issue rather clearly. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in uh, whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. On the face of things following little interpretation, this passage seems to suggest that the God of this world, Satan, is currently deceiving individuals within the nations. In fact, the apostle seems to suggest that all lost individuals among the nations of the world are being blinded by Satan. To diminish the direct import of the passage, Storms makes some assumptions. First, he assumes that good angels may actually aid in hindering Satan. 
we may rest assured that in some way they, good angels, are present to strengthen, guard, and encourage those who proclaim the gospel, and perhaps even to restrain the adverse influence of the demonic who would seek to undermine the reception of the gospel. This almost sounds as an admission that Satan's dominion is actually deceiving individuals within the people groups of the world, something he has denied in his discussion in Revelation 20. Second, Storms relativizes the deceiving ministry of Satan. In another place, in the book, he comments, in other words, it is the influence of the church as a result of the universal preaching of the gospel which inhibits the activity of Satan in this particular regard. Though Satan still, Satan still blinds the minds of the unbelieving, he is providentially restricted from hindering the pervasive expansion of the gospel throughout the world. Satan may win an occasional battle, but the war belongs to Christ. The premillennialist looks at such a comment and interprets Storm's words as teaching a partial deceiving of the nations. Blinding means deceiving. Revelation 23 teaches that for 1,000 years, Satan will do no deceiving of the nations. Storms is attempting to have his cake and eat it too. However, such partial deception by Satan is not consistent with the binding of Satan taught in the Bible for the millennium. In the end, the premillennialist remains confident that his approach to the structure of the book of Revelation, especially chapters 19 to 20, is correct. Satan will be bound in a future time that begins at the second coming of Christ. The premillennialist will continue to believe the amillennialists have not made their case. Conclusion, Sam Storms has provided a helpful work in Kingdom Come. In addition to a short survey of his work, this article has addressed four areas of Bible interpretation from his book, 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 8, the gap between the, in the 69th and 70th week in Daniel, and the book of Revelation, especially chapter 20. The large amount of detail provided by Storms deserves a longer response. However, it does not appear that there are a lot of new amillennial interpretations provided by Storms. Nonetheless, the collection of the massive amount of data will make his work one of the standard defenses of amillennialism in the days ahead. Premillennialists, however, will remain unconvinced by the theological assumptions and arguments for his position. Thank you very much. Um, back in the 80s, I used to go to an annual conference called the Salado Conference, and it was largely made up of uh, Dallas Seminary graduates who uh, were strongly reformed. And Sam Storms, I still have his paper, uh, presented his first uh, paper on why Revelation 19 didn't follow Revelation or is, was not followed by Revelation 20. And Lewis Johnson was always there. And I remember talking to him afterwards, and he said he was embarrassed for Sam, uh, who was one of his disciples, so to speak, and uh, that this was a pitiful, if I remember correctly, the exact word, a pitiful paper and some of the worst scholarship that Sam had ever done. And uh, he then, you know, a little circle had gathered around and he went on and expounded the errors of Sam's paper. But it looks like he hadn't changed since yeah. the 80s, even with Lewis Johnson's uh, critique. And I have had a debate with post-millennial Ken Gentry and a debate with uh, Greg Bill, another Dallas grad who is Amil. And uh, I asked both of them in these debates, uh, at least from a pre prima facie standpoint, premillennialism has a passage not um, to mention all of the Old Testament evidence. And that is that Revelation 20 f follows Revelation 19. Thus, Christ returns, and he sets up his millennium. Do you have a similar passage for amillennialism or a similar passage for postmillennialism? And, of course, they didn't. I can't tell you what either said, but it was a bunch of mumbo-jumbo because these, their views are theologically deduced, not exegetically uh, produced and I appreciate the really good job you did focusing in on these uh, key points. 
And one of the things, you know, we are the only group left, um, I say we, I'm talking about dispensationalists, who champion inductive Bible study. Right, right. Nobody else doing that. Well, we need to keep it up. Yeah, uh, any questions, go to the microphones if you're able, or if you're not able to, raise your hand and uh, let us know what you may have, question you may have, or uh, part of the discussion. But, you know, amillennialism, if you look in church history, before amillennialism was developed by Augustine in the city of God, you had anti-millennialism. People who were just opposed to the thousand years, like uh, Jerome, who said away with the thousand years and all of this. And, uh, you know, it, it, everybody knows it's the result of allegorical interpretation from the school of Alexandria and stuff like this. And I remember, is Wayne House here or he's going to speak next? I guess he's getting ready. He's cramming. He's cramming, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, you know, he's put so much in that brain over the years, I don't know if he's got any room left, but nevertheless, uh, he, he gave a paper once uh, showing that all of the amillennial, anti-millennialism began in Alexandria, Egypt, it, it, but in the rest of Christendom in the early church was totally premillennial. And it began because Alexandria had become, in fact, uh, you know, Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC uh, created Alexandria, Egypt. Many of the philosophers from Athens had moved there, and it, it had become the center of Greek philosophy uh, by the time of the early church. And everybody understands and knows that, you know, it was that allegorical hermeneutic. Ah Mills even acknowledged that, but yet it doesn't seem to impact their thinking. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I tell my students, I talk about the revival in the second century, the um, revival of Greek classics that took place in the second century. Let's get back to classical Greek, not that stupid Koine Greek of the New Testament. You know, the culture wanted to get back to the uh, Attic classic Greek. And then they, also wanted to get back to some classic philosophy. Well, they had a lot of choices. They picked Plato. And so you have a revival of that, which starts to influence things. And of course, Plato, you remember the cave in the Republic? You know, and what's the big deal? And what's the real thing in Plato? It's not the real thing. It's the ideal thing, which has no use for a concrete kingdom idea. And so I, I always tell my students, and I'm sure Westminster doesn't agree with me on this time, <laughs> but I tell my students that amillennialism owes more to Plato than it does the Bible. Right. Exactly. Go ahead, Joe. Mike, uh, awesome presentation. Thank you so much. We hear of dispensationalists from time to time becoming amillennialists, but do we hear very many amillennial theologians shifting to a dispensational position? There, there is a highway where it's got two lanes, one going on each side. So yeah, there in our postmodern culture, there's a lot of shifting going on everywhere. So we do see some converts coming our way. Uh, but we tend to grieve about the ones going the other way, so we emphasize them more a little bit. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I have students who used to be on milk. Yeah, I've been told by graduates of Westminster Seminary that probably half you know, and this has been over the years, probably half of the students that graduate from Westminster lean toward premillennialism even, even there, you know, and, and things. I don't know if that's true, that's what I, I was told, but it's interesting, uh, you know, on the 70 weeks of Daniel, uh, in fact, back in the late 1940s, a guy named Knowles wrote uh, an article in the Westminster Theological Journal and for you lay folk, laymen, in other words, Westminster would be a champion of amillennialism. Uh, and he showed that the first three people in the early church to teach on the 70 weeks of Daniel all taught a postponement of the 70th week. And yet, many people think that uh, this, the gap between the 69th and 70th week is something modern dispensationalists came up with. In fact, you'll even find that in some people's writings when 
the three earliest interpretations. Uh, you have Irenaeus, you have Hippolytus, and I forget the other guy a little later, uh, all took a post, said that the 70th week had to be postponed. So this was antedates, it's the earliest view in the church, doesn't make it right. I'm just saying it's been around, but many people think it's something dispensationalist invented. Go ahead. Yeah, there, there was a uh, professor at Southern Seminary. Um, you know, they have premillennialists there. Right. But they had one omelettist, I forget which one it was, who was asked by his church to speak on Sunday nights and go through the book of Revelation. And when he got to 19 and 20, he was on mill. He announced his conversion to pre-mill. Uh, so that is happening. And I don't know if that was a high up famous one at Southern or one of the lower lights, but one of the, that story came to me through students um, of this guy's conversion to premillennialism. So the, the text is grabbing people's hearts Yeah. Uh, still. Of course, Bruce Ware is a famous, mm -hmm. actually a dispensationalist even at Southern, and I believe that it was the same church that he, Bruce Ware, and another guy uh, go to. I heard about that same yeah. story. Yeah. Any other questions or comments, testimonies, prayer requests? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mike.